Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for asking me back to speak to the, the bird watching club again. Um, tonight, I'm going to I'm going to do a new talk for you. I put it together based on my travels to the Antarctic um, that I did in 2019, um, and I'm going to show you quite a lot of, sh lot of slides. Uh, it's as I say, a brand new talk, so be gentle with me. And I'm going to start right at the beginning, and I'm going to start with where my story about going to the Antarctic starts. And it starts with this guy. And this guy is Stanley Kale. He's my grandfather. And he was born in 1898. So when he was 14, the famous expedition, the Terra Nova expedition that Captain Scott led to the Antarctic, was, was making the headlines because on the 17th of January 1912, Scott managed to get to the Antarctic. And and this is my grandfather in 1916 when he joined the Royal Artillery and went to fight in the First World War. But when he was when he was 14, of course, Scott's epics were all in the in the, the newspapers. And so, as a boy of 14, it it sort of inspired him and filled his head with notions of the British Empire and one thing and another. So, Scott unfortunately died on the on the way back, as as you will know. Um, my grandfather filled me with stories about Captain Scott because he had obviously played a, a big point in his life in later years. And he bought me, when I was a child, he bought me this little book, this lady with a book. Some of you may even recognise this, all about Captain Scott. And it, it sort of fired the imagination. But what he also did, he, he took, took really a message that Scott actually wrote in his last diary entry into the journal. It was a message to his wife and his son, and it said, make the boy interested in wildlife. And I think my granddad tried to do the same with me, because when I was a child, he used to show me song thrushes in the back garden at his place and talk to me about birds and drawing and one thing and another. And, and I got interested in, in bird watching. But on Scott's trip was a famous ornithologist, um, a chap called Edward Wilson, Bill Wilson, his name was. And he, he actually died on the way back from the pole. He was one of the five men who got to the pole and found that Amundsen, the Norwegian, had beaten them to it. And he, he died on the way back, but on the way there, on, and, and the previous expeditions that they'd done, he, he made fantastic notes and sketches of all the birds that he, 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 he seen, he'd seen on these travels. And he'd taken a lot of specimens. And as you can see, if I use my cursor here, you can see these are drawn from dead specimens and they did a lot of skinning and, and where they went, they, 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 they took specimens of whatever they could. Some made it back, some didn't. And of course, on the Terra Nova trip, when they, none of them came back, there were very few came back. There was, there was a lot of the specimens were lost. But nonetheless, many, many years later, a guy called Brian Roberts wrote a, 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 a sort of, almost a biography of Wilson, and put a load of his sketches together into this book. And when I'd been bird watching not that long, I started when I was 12 and a half, something like that, really seriously getting interested in birds. And shortly after I went to work, I went into a little, little reminded bookshop in, in, in Dudley in the Midlands, and I came across this book. And I think they were selling it for five pounds, if I remember rightly. And it was full of, full of those lovely sketches that you just saw. And I bought it. But at the time, I never connected up the dots, but I did later. Um, now, what I'm going to show you now is two or three maps, and I'm just going to really give you some idea of the journey that we did. Now, if you ignore this line with the aeroplane here, because we didn't, we didn't fly, other than flying to Buenos Aires and then halfway down, which is up here, halfway down Argentina to the Valdez Peninsula, um, we, didn't, we didn't do any flying. Um, we, we went by ship from the Valdez Peninsula. Um, we, we joined the, the ship at a place called Puerto Madryn, and we, we sailed basically down here and out to sea to the Falkland Islands. We did Caucasus Island at the top here, and we went to the Falklands. And then we, we took this exact same route that it shows you on this map here, out to South Georgia, and we explored South Georgia to some degree. Then we came down here and we went to Elephant Island. And, and from here, we cut down to the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and cut through this channel and into the Weddell Sea. Um, we, were, we were hoping to get Emperor Penguin in the, in the Weddell Sea, but, but we, we didn't manage that, mainly because the weather closed in and, and the forecast in the Weddell, Weddell Sea meant we were basically going to sit in a fog bank for several days. So they about turned the ship and we went off over to Deception Island, which is here. And I'll talk to you a bit. You're going to go to, effectively, we're going to go to all these islands as we go through. And then from Deception Island, we worked our way down here 
down uh, along the, this, this strait, which is called the Bransfield Strait. And then eventually, after we'd explored various places down here and made landings on islands and, and on the coast, we got almost to the, well, we actually got just to the Antarctic Circle. And then we about turned, we came back through here, and back across the Drake Passage, which took us two days to get across the Drake Passage, and into the Beagle Channel and up to Ushuaia. And that's where we ended our Antarctic leg of the journey. Now, we did bird in seriously bird in, in northern Argentina, both on the way out and on the way back. But we, I just, it was just too big a subject to cover in, in this talk as well. So I'm just touching on Argentina at the start of the, 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 the actual uh, trip to the Antarctic and, and at the, the, the tail end when we get to Ushuaia, just to give you a flavour of the, the wildlife that's there. But it's in, in, in South Georgia, which I'll talk to you about in, in some detail, we basically came down this northern side, exploring various places like Gold Harbour, St Andrews Bay, Grit Vicken, and some of these places, Salisbury Plain, all named, given a lot of them given English names, well, perhaps Grit Vicken, but a lot of them given English names because we were the first real nation that got there and we sort of claimed it as one of our overseas territories. Um, and so I'm going to... I'll talk to you a little bit about, uh, well, quite a bit about South Georgia because it, it is a very impressive island. And lastly, I'm just going to give you a little bit of geography on the, the Antarctic itself. I mean, you can see there's the pole. That's the, that's, there's an American base at the pole. Um, and um, this is the shape of the Antarctic, and it's, it's bisected by the, the Transantarctic Mountains, which you can see here. But the peninsula, so this is, this is what's called Lesser Antarctic or, or, or West Antarctic, and this is East Antarctic, Great Antarctic. The peninsula itself is basically a chain of mountains that's broken away into, into, into islands as you come up here. And this is where we came down into this area, into the Weddell Sea, then back around and explored these islands into the Arctic Circle, Antarctic Circle, I apologise, and then away like so. So that just gives you some idea. And you can get some idea of the, of the huge ice shelves here. This is the, the last ice shelf and the Rhone ice shelf. And these are where the, the big sort of emperor emperor penguin colonies are, although the main one that Scott went to was this one here down on the Ross Ice Shelf, and this is the point here where Scott actually made his ill-fated attempt. They came up through here, up through there, and, and, and got to the pole that way, so they made it the, the quickest way up and back that they possibly could, but nonetheless, that was still close to 800 miles, as I, as I understand it. You wouldn't want to walk it yourself. Um, and it was a, a tough journey, and they set up food dumps and that along the way. And unfortunately, they were within 11 miles of a food dump when they when the, the five of them died. And so that's that's that was the end of their expedition. But nonetheless, his story inspired, well, not only one generation but several generations. So without further ado, I'm going to start where we started in sort of central Argentina, where we'd left Buenos Aires, and we flew down to a place called Trelew. And we got off, the, the guy who'd organised it all got us off the, off the, the, the aircraft and he said, right, we're going to the hotel. So we to this hotel and we were on the bus five minutes and he said, well, we're supposed to be doing, we're supposed to be doing 70 kilometres. And we spoke to the, uh, the, 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 the girl in reception and she said, no, this is the right hotel, you, hotel you're booked in here. And the, the, right from where it go, the, the, the clang had dropped on where we were going to stay. And we thought, oh, crikey, well, what do we do here now? So we said, there was a local taxi driver in the foyer and we started talking to him and we said, where do people go to see birds around here? He said, oh, I don't know. I'm not a, I don't know anything about birds. I said, well, if you wanted to see a lot of birds around here, where would you go? He said, oh, the Black Lagoon. I said, what's the Black Lagoon? He said, it's a sewage pond. I said, right, take us there. And this was the scene that greeted us. There were hundreds and hundreds of birds there, thousands of birds. And, and a bit of a shock, as you can see there, were flamingos because... I never for one minute thought I would be seeing flamingos on a trip I was going to the Antarctic. But there were also masses of wildfowl, and in particular, Argentine red shoveler. And you can see the, the sort of numbers that there were, and they're absolutely stunning ducks, much like a cross between our shoveler in shape and a pintail, because they've got more of a pintail. But they're, they're just really lovely ducks, and they, they tend to feed in these great big rafts. Um, now I'm gonna as I go through this, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk very briefly about each bird, but I'm not gonna dwell on them too long because I've got so many slides I want to show you this evening. Um, so Argentine red shovel were, were uh, great numbers there, and we saw lots of these guys, these Chilean flamingos. And as I say, I just really was not expecting to see these these fellows. And there were things like like um, chimango caracaras and various coots and stuff like that in there. But when we finished at the Black Lagoon. 
we uh, we went back to the town and uh, we, we we decided to walk down into the town and we found just like a, a huge park lake and it was again stuffed full of wildfowl but the real highlights of this lake were the grebes um and the, these are silvery grebes and there were about oh well, maybe maybe 10 or a dozen of these silvery grebes this is a pair and they were they were just getting ready to nest. And we had fabulous views of these, and they're really, really smart, smart, smart birds. About, about the same size as a black neck grebe, and much like a black neck grebe, as you can see. Um, that's a that's a, a, a male silvery grebe, and you can see the nice, the nice plumes on the head here. Um, and then there were white tufted grebes as well, but we got tremendous views of these birds and, and really, really good. So they set the scene because these were two of the birds that were on the Falklands. And because we, because this was a, it was a, a, a long trip, but it was a whistle stop tour to many places. We were sort of fingers crossed that we'd see a lot of these birds in these various places in the short time that we had on, on each place. So we we already got really superb views of these grebes, and it was a good job we did because of those two we didn't actually see again on the entire trip. Um, this is the ship we picked up. I mean, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit here. This is the the MV Honduras. Um, and this is a ship we picked up in Puerto Madryn, but this photograph I took in, in the Falklands. But as we boarded the ship, it became apparent that Puerto Madryn itself, after we'd driven there the next morning, was pretty, fairly, fairly few birds there, really. There weren't that many birds, and it was a, a typical sort of sea-type town, really. Um, but the one thing that was in, in numbers in the, in the water around the harbour, and as we, as we set off, were, were these guys, and this is great grebe. Um, this is not a full breeding plumage adult. The head goes completely black on a full adult, but it just looked like a, a bird that was starting to molt into, into, into its breeding plumage. But, um, but these were, 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 were fantastic birds, and they're like a, the size of a, a size of a diver, really. And you can see that huge great bill, absolute monster of a bill. Um, and they feed just like our greaves, but they were in the sea, as you would expect to see great crests in the winter or redneck greaves in the winter, but they were feeding around, around, the, around the ship. And there were, there were, oh, maybe 20 or 30 of these guys, but most of them looked to be immature birds. So we, we boarded the ship fairly quickly and, and, and away we sailed. And we got the best part of two days sailing until we, we reached, uh, reached uh, well, one and a half, really, to be truthful, until we reached the Falklands. We were doing the best part of 250 miles to, to actually get to the Falklands. But no sooner we were out of port and, and the first giant petrels were around the ship, and, and this is southern giant petrel. I'll talk more about these petrels as we as we go through. Um, and pretty well, giant petrels were with us pretty well constantly for the whole of the trip. Um, and they were following the ships. Different birds, obviously not the same one. It'd have been pretty tired if it was, but uh, different birds were with us all the way through. And we we hadn't been going that far, and and we started seeing blackbird albatross. Um, and and certainly this was the commonest albatross that we did see. Absolute superb birds. These are these are adults, the juveniles, the young younger birds have a, a black tip to the bill and a paler bill. But these these um, black red albatrosses were fantastic birds, and they were with us on and off for the again for the whole trip. We saw black red albatross pretty well every day we were there. Um, and and what was really interesting was was on the, the second day at sea, as we were sort of steaming towards the Falkland Islands. We started to notice a stream of black bad albatrosses all heading northwards past the ship. Oh, pretty well. You'd see T1, and then a moment or two later, another one would appear on the horizon, and he'd go, and then two would appear, and then another one, and there'd be a gap for a minute or two, and then another one. And this stream was pretty well constant, and it was obviously hundreds of birds all heading off to a feeding ground. And, and at this point, we were still well over 100 miles from the Falklands itself. And it turns out these birds will travel hundreds of miles on a round trip to go and feed. But we had absolute tremendous views of them. And, and as we got closer to the Falklands, we started to see more exciting stuff like prions. Now, this, this it turned out is an Antar Antarctic prion, which we saw many of. And there were three common species of prions being Antarctic, uh, fairy prion, uh, or dove prion, whatever you like to call it, but proper name's fairy, and slender build later. Um, but we did see other species of prion, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. But but years ago, they were only they were only initially identified as, as two species being broad-billed prion and what they called prion. Um, but it's now been re recognised that there are a multitude of species that all look very, very similar. The other thing that was interesting, as we approached the Falklands, 
in the, after, the afternoon of the second day, we, we started getting a wading bird flying around the ship and we were trying to identify what it was. It, it was buzzing the ship and eventually it landed. And this was it, it landed on one of the Zodiacs at the back of the ship. The Zodiacs are like rigid inflatable boats for those of you that don't know, that you actually go ashore on from the larger ship. And it was a, it's a juvenile white rump sandpiper. Um, it's actually a, 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 a molting into first winter. You see, it's got sort of juvenile feathers here. And it's got the, the the new the new sort of winter feathers coming here. But it's a, it's a juvenile white rump sandpiper. He was absolutely exhausted, and he plucked up his courage and finally landed in front of all the bird watchers on this zodiac. And he and he had a sleep and a preen, and he was there for about three hours. And just before dusk, he he took off and and headed off south into the distance and away, and we never saw him again. Um, and presumably he made it to the Falklands. But it just shows you how how many how many birds must must land like this. And indeed, when we got up the following morning, we, the the boat was there were loads and loads of moths on the boat, and there there'd, there'd been a, a a wind offshore um, off the Argentinian coast, and these were obviously moths that were now way out to sea. I mean, the, the Falklands is sort of two hundred miles from the southern tip of Argentina, so these these moths were way out to sea, and and. There, were, there must have been, oh, I don't know, 60, 70, maybe more than that. It was hard to say. But there were a lot of moths, all the same species they looked, um, around the ship, which just shows you these, these creatures are carried out to sea by the wind. So the Falkland Islands was, was our first real major port of call. Um, this is Carcass Island. And, and I was really surprised. I, I really expected them to be grey and dreary-looking places. And I suppose on a, in a gale they are, but, but I just thought what a beautiful place it was. Um, it was just stunning, very, very unspoilt and remote. Um, a lot of birds there. Um, these are these are Gen 2 penguins that were coming to Cook Shore. We saw a, quite close here, we saw a, a Gen 2 penguin colony, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, and these were birds that were coming out of the surf that had been off on, on a fishing trip and were coming back to the colony and were walking inland. And we had Magellanic penguins as well coming in. Um, although we didn't see anywhere near the numbers of Magellanic penguins that we did of the other species, which I'll talk to you about later in the, later in the trip. Um, so Magellanic penguins are, are, are quite unique in terms of the, 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 the sort of Antarctic, the Western Antarctic and the, the islands around there, because they breed in a burrow as opposed to the other, the other um, species of penguins breeding on, on, on sort of... Uh, Rock mounds and, and and piles of stones that they built themselves. So this is a this is a Magellanic penguin, and he's more closely related to the the little penguin, uh, the Galap and the Galapagos penguin, and and the Jackass penguin, and and so he's in that group. And those all tend to nest in burrows, but he's the only representative in this part of the globe. Um, quite a nice looking bird, and he's he's quite got quite a stocky bill. He's not got the sort of pointed bill that many of the other penguins have. And that's one. That's the best I could do, unfortunately. I've one in a in a burrow itself because obviously we were looking down a down like a, a rabbit hole here. Um, and it was interesting. He pulled a lot of grasses and bits of straw and stuff into the, the burrow to make a proper little nest for himself or herself. And then was sitting incubating an egg there. So we just took one quick photograph and came away. And the bird was totally unfazed by us. Left us to it. And that's one of the things about the Falkland Islands. A lot of the birds are just they just not bothered whatsoever about humans. As long as you don't really interfere with them, you just stand and watch them, give them a little bit of space, and, and the birds are quite accepting of you. They don't, they don't see you as a threat. So a little way from where that, that uh, Magellanic penguin was, we there was a, a Gen 2 penguin colony, and you can see, so these are Gen 2s here, um, and they're just a slightly different subspecies, minor little differences in build size and and head markings and that to the to the ones in the Antarctic proper. But for all intents and purposes, they look the same, but they are classed as different subspecies. And you'll hear me talking about subspecies a lot. And you can see there this 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 penguin here is in, incubating on an egg. And you can see the, the other bird is adding bits and pieces of moss and, and sort of like peat really. The ground was very peaty to the to the nest pile itself. Um, and so we got really good views of them. But of course with all of these colonies of birds they attract predators and scavengers um, and this is this is one of the the primary scavengers on the outlying islands in particular this is this is a striated caracara or johnny rook as he's known locally and he said that's the, the sort of falkland island is mine and they're they're a, 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 
they are a, a, a hunter, but they have got not the same sort of killing apparatus that some of the big eagles and that have got. They haven't got really, really sharp claws, and the bill isn't as, as big and strong as a lot of the big predators. But nonetheless, they can still do considerable damage, and they're scavenging after dead chicks and eggs, and and they, even even droppings of uh, the, the the penguins. Um, secrete because the, the droppings are largely krill based so there's, there's still obviously an awful lot of nutrients in the droppings as they pass through the other end of the penguins and and and, and around them not only the, are, are they the caracaras there but they're also brown skewers um and 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 these are these are Falkland Islands brown skewers and you can see there this this one we were standing watching and one of the one of the gentoos stood up and sort of turned sideways and looked took its eye off the ball and quick as a flash, this skill was in and grabbed its egg and took it over to the other side of the colony. And then these are these were obviously a mated pair. And then they proceeded to smash the egg and, and eat the inside of it. Um, and, uh, and and this is obviously a, a sort of major thing with 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 these skewers. They, they take a lot of the, a lot of penguin eggs. So that's why the, the penguins have to be really mindful. And, and, and be on their guard all the while. But if I go back slightly one, I would suggest that probably that is the female bird of the pair and that is the male, because unlike gulls, skewers are much like raptors in so much as the fact that they, they, the females are bigger than the males in terms of the, 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 the size and structure of the bird. And gulls, it's the other way around. So the females tend to be really big and bulky. Now, the, the taxonomy of these skewers, there are three species, three full species, as it stands in, in the Southern Hemisphere. So you've got brown skewer, you've got Chilean skewer, which I'll show you later, and, and you've got South Pole skewer, which I'll show you later. And the, the, two, the last two, the Chilean and the South Pole, it's, it's quite obvious that they're different species, but some authorities class brown skewer, or they certainly did, uh, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a subspecies of great skewer or the other way around, whichever way you like to look at it. But needless to say, in various places like Gough Island and South Georgia, the, the skewers there are, again, subtly different subspecies. So the brown skewers on, on these are Falkland brown skewers, the brown skewers on South Georgia are classed as subantarctic brown skewers, so they're a slightly different subspecies, but I'll show you those in a, in a little while. So there's the skewers clobbering a poor Gen 2 penguin said. But there's an awful lot of wildfowl on the, on the islands as well. As, um, the, this genus of geese is represented by four or five species in South, South America and the islands. And this is, this is upland goose. Now, this, this um, particular subspecies is just found on the Falklands. I'll show you some upland goose towards the end, just a brief shot of, on the mainland back at Ushuaia, and they're a subtly different subspecies. So again, this is, the, this is the, the male, and these are the females here. But there are big numbers of geese, and some of them had, all, had also got youngsters. Um, they looked like, there didn't seem to be sort of any clear pattern here. There were an awful lot of birds aimlessly wandering about, but there were obvious pairs with young in other places. So it was hard to work out. It seemed that the majority of, of the species there were actually breeding. Um, and we, we were there in, at the end of October, beginning of November. And um, so a lot of the birds, it was obviously going into their summer, so a lot of the birds would be breeding at that point. And certainly the penguins were on eggs and the, and the, the things like we saw, we saw uh, young Magellanic, a baby Magellanic snipe and this sort of stuff. So there, were, there was a lot, of, a lot of nesting going on. Um, in that same genus of geese, there's another, another nice one that tends to hang around the shore a lot. This is kelp goose. Um, there, the, the, again, the, the male is the white bird, the female is doing is the, the brown bird here. Um, and I, I have to say, I think I, I think I prefer the prefer the female. I think she's a really nice looking bird. And they were they were feeding on well, they appear to be feeding on the on the seaweed, grazing on the seaweed on the edge. Uh, I imagine that's how they get their name, kelp goose, but uh, but I mean, I, I didn't get really the chance to study it in great detail to really be sure that that's what they were eating. Because obviously, on a whistle stop tour, you're trying to photograph and record as much as you can. And so sometimes the finer details are you don't have time to take them in. This is Falkland Island steamer duck. Um, and on, on the mainland, there are another another two or three species of steamer ducks. There's a flightless and, and a flying steamer duck. Um, and there's a third one slightly further north. But uh, this is Falkland Island steamer duck, and this is a, this is a, a drake with the orange bill. The females tend to be duller with a with a, a brown, more brownish bill. Um, and they're quite a 
big duck, and they they sort of fill the niche in the southern hemisphere that Ida's fill in the northern hemisphere, and and so the, the islands themselves have got an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of wildfowl. This is yellow-billed teal, um, and a, a, another nice bird, crested duck, well, another one on the on the edge of the uh, on the edge of the sea. These are nice birds. You can just about make out the crest on the on the male there. They're really nice birds. Dolphin gull. They were they were uh, um, really really good birds to see. These dolphin gulls were um, were on the shoreline. These are younger birds with the with the brown in the wing. That was a a, a, a sub adult bird. The previous one I showed you. And so dolphin gulls were uh, were, the, were were sort of filled the niche of our herring gulls, if you like, on there. But the bird you saw just a moment ago, they was eating like a seed pod off the kelp. Um, so they are really, really stunning birds. Another birds are represented by things like Magellanic oyster catcher here, which is subtly different to our oyster catcher, which I'm sure you can see. Well, the wrens were interesting. We've got two species of wrens, Cobb's wren, which is endemic to the Falklands. Um, this is Cobb's wren. Um, picks along the tide line and, and, and in the, in the, a lot of the sedges there. Quite a big wren, feeds on, on, on invertebrates that's sort of scattered among the tide line and in the sedges on the, on the grass shore. And this is, this is grass wren or sedge wren, whichever name you like to call it. And this is an endemic subspecies to the Falklands, but sedge wren is, is found right throughout South America. Indeed, I think probably the most northerly population is there's a small isolated population of a subspecies of this in Costa Rica. But I, I imagine that that, that that in time will be split. So this is moving on from Cox Island. This is Port Stanley. Um, you can see that's about as high rise as it gets in Port Stanley. Um, Quite a nice little place. And in the harbour to Port Stanley, there's there's this wreck, this old wreck. This is the Lady Liz. Um, and she was damaged in a storm off Cape Horn in 1913 and put in for repairs, and she was never repaired. But the interesting thing was that during the, the during the Falklands War, uh, this was the base for RSAS, and they hid in this, this wreck, in virtually in plain sight of, uh, of Port Stanley, and this is where they conducted their missions from. <laughs> so that was quite interesting. And on the shore nearby, we've got things like two-banded plover feeding, We've got a few white lump sandpipers there, so this is a wintering area for white lump sandpiper. <coughs> Pardon me, but these are these are a stunning bird. They really are nice, like a, a big member of the ring plover group. And this is the this is the the the, the local subspecies of of black crown night heron. And what was interesting, you can see there they've become cliff colony nesters, um, slightly darker darker than the the mainland subspecies, and it's quite a dusky looking night heron, but. Quite nice birds to see, like this. Something unusual seeing them in a clifftop sea colony. And again, um, another predator on the on the, on the on the main islands. This is variable hawk. Um, some of them have reddish backs. A lot of the a lot of the ones we saw were quite grey, but they, uh, hence the name variable hawk. And they're they're a, a close relative of the buzzard. They're in, the, in that South American hawk stroke buzzard family, um, as you can see there. And th again, this is quite a widespread species, so it's not a, endemic to to the Falklands. So as we left as we left Port Stanley, the the the, the weather closed in and uh, we were heading that's a giant petrel again there you can see. And you can see as the as the as the weather closes in so it does become a little more foreboding. Um, and as we as we left lots of sooty shear waters coming past you, big numbers of sooty sooty shear waters at times uh, coming in through because they obviously just come in returning to, to the breeding grounds there. And Wilson's petrels with us. This is actually uh, again, another one of these taxonomic uh, things. The so Wilson's petrel has actually been broken up into several subspecies, and I think I think they say Picoya. Uh, this is this is Fuegan, uh subspecies of Wilson's petrel from the Falklands, but off Peru, there's one that they've just identified as or split as Picoya. Um, Wilson's petrel, and again, I dare say in time, I'll probably split that because there's an awful lot of splitting and lumping going on with various species in that part of the world. So this is Wilson's petrel again here. And you can see the wing bar is just a little bit duskier than we'd expect to see on birds that come up this far in the Atlantic. But out here, these are very, very minor differences. So this is just the, the Falkland subspecies. And one of the specialities in terms of the storm petrels that we saw, I, I apologise for this per photograph, is greyback storm petrel. And we, we saw half a dozen of these during the trip, but nowhere are they really numerous. But they just didn't hang around and we didn't get really, really close views of them, unlike most of the, the seabirds. 
person, but still, nonetheless, we actually saw them. And they often like to float, uh, feed around these floating mats of kelp, where the where mats of kelp have been ripped from the seabed and float on the surface. They like to, to, to feed around there, and I suppose it attracts small fry and things like that for them. The, the, the giant petrels were were really really numerous. This is a this is a first year bird you can see, and he's got a, a dark eye and he's dark all over. And as they age, the eye changes colour, and so does the plumage. It becomes gradually whiter. So you can see here the giant petrel getting as he's getting older and and whiter until they get to this point. So this should be pretty well a full adult. <laughs> pardon me, full adult giant petrel. And interestingly, if you look. One of the major features you see is this green end to the bill on northern giant petrel, which I'll show you in a, in a, in a few minutes, that was actually reddish. We had a few um, really special pterodromas come in. This is, this is Atlantic petrel, which we, were, we only saw two of these on the entire trip. Um, so that was a, a bit of a, a star. This was the next day when we were part way out towards South Georgia, because um, from the Falklands, you're looking at probably uh, eight, 900 miles to the actual to, to South Georgia from there, so quite a sea crossing. Cryons are with us, but also well, here you've got, this is blue petrel, we were seeing the first blue petrels, and, and cape pigeons or pintado petrels, whatever you like to call them, they're pretty special, and both of these birds I'll talk to you about in a, in a little while. Halfway out to, to South Georgia, you come to Shad, what are called Shad Rocks, um, and, and the, the clue is in the tin, you can see all these little dots, those are all cormorants and shags in the air. And so you've got these guys, these are imperial blue-eyed shag, or blue-eyed cormorant, whatever you like to call them. And that's the one from, from shag rocks and from into the Antarctic more so. And this is the one from the Falkland Islands. Um, there's also rock cormorants there in good numbers. And again, these are on, on breeding stack, although I, take, I, I hasten to add this was taken in the Falklands, not on those rocks, because they're so dangerous, the ships avoid them and don't go anywhere near those rocks, as you can probably imagine. And the first Antarctic fur seals, we were seeing these. Now, what was interesting, on the mainland of South Georgia, we were seeing lots of adult males um, and youngsters, but very few females, and they were still out to sea. They were just coming in ready to, they were just obviously in season, coming in ready to breed. And at this point, this is where we started to see the first icebergs. And they are, some of these icebergs that we're coming up to are absolutely colossal. Black-bellied storm petrels put in appearances. We saw quite a few of these, but again, they didn't hang around. We didn't get really, really prolonged close views. They were in, into the ship's wake and away again. So you've got to be fast. And, and I, I mentioned prions, and this is fairy prion. These are the, the first fairy prions we were seeing. So these are fairy prions. And if I show you this next shot, so you've actually got two species. This is Antarctic prion. And this is fairy prion, and if you look, you can see it's a much slighter build in the head. It's got a darker tip to the tail. The wing pattern isn't as strong, and it's a more lightly built bird, smaller bill, etc. And in, in in the field, because these are the ships bouncing around, and these things are coming in thick and fast, trying to sort them out in the field takes a little bit of doing. Um, so this is Antarctic prion again, and as I say, there are there are actually seven species. Ident identified species, but there are other subspecies, and there's a lot of talk about splitting some of those up as well. So these are these are uh, this is an Antarctic prion, and just like many of these petrels and albatrosses, they've got this bump on the forehead, quite a big bump on the forehead, and that turns out to be what holds part of the skull that holds the olfactory gland, and that's a, a really highly developed sense of, uh, uh, smell organ, and that's that's how they find a lot of their food. Now, we saw huge flux prions, and at times doing this, I mean, it was, it, it, you see them all wheeling about in the air, sometimes, you know, up to, up to maybe 200 feet above the air, above the water. And you think, well, what are they, what are they doing up here? And, and some of you may know Bob Flood. I was talking to Bob about this. And I said to him, do you know why they do this? And he said, no, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. And I said to him, well, I, I've come up with a bit of a theory on it. And he said, what's that? And I'm not sure Bob, Bob bought the theory, but my theory is that during rough weather, they feed on a lot of plankton, these birds do. And, and I have to say that I think some of the plankton in the spray of the waves becomes airborne. And that's why these birds wheel around like this. I think they're feeding in just the same way as we see black-headed gulls feeding on fly, flying ants in the, in, in the late summer. I think that's what these guys are doing. I think they're feeding on, on plankton that's become airborne. Um, I may well be wrong, but I can't understand why else they would do it. And, and in nature, as you probably know, there's a reason for everything. So 
we, we, we steam on and, and we get to South Georgia and this is the site that greets us. And what an island, it's just, it's just fantastic. Some of these peaks are 6,000 feet high. Uh, this is St Andrews Bay and it looks pretty devoid of life, but there is the biggest king penguin colony on earth. And here you go, half a million birds. Um, and it is just, the noise is fantastic. And the smell is something else. And the birds are just tremendous. And in actual fact, I'm photographing and I felt a peck and I turned around and one is pecking up my coat to try and see what I was. <laughs> he just walked up to me and he's just inquisitive. He wasn't at all dangerous. And you can see elephant seals here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those. And this is the main rookery. These are all the youngsters, the brown ones. Um, and, and that's the site that greeted us because obviously they have quite a long a long breeding cycle, so they're over 12 months, and these are well-growing young. Um, and there were a lot of adults coming in that were clearly just about getting ready to breed again, so this is an ongoing cycle that are well-growing young and, and, and youngsters at the same time. And here's a, here's, a, here's a youngster just after its parents. So I'm going indu to indulge me a little bit. But you can see again at the point I make about predators, there's a, a sub-Antarctic brown skewer hanging around the, the colony there. And they, they hang around with all these, these king penguins that are just getting ready to, to breed. I think they're hoping for an odd egg or an odd dead bird or whatever. Further up the coast, by going back sort of uh, westwards, there's another big um, king penguin colony. This is a place called Salisbury Plain. Um, <laughs> I, I like the way we gave them all our British names. Um, this is the colony itself in land. This is the main rookery there. Look, you can see the same the same thing, although the weather, weather wasn't quite as good. And you can see skewers overhead here, look, and kelp gulls as, as you go into them. Well, the, the beaches are dominated by elephant seals. This is a, a bull elephant seal. You've got to hear a couple of beach masters, what they call beach masters, are having a, a bit of an argy bargy. And the poor, old, the poor old king penguins have to run the gauntlet of these things. And these are female elephant seals here, as you can see. Um, and and, and these, these males that weigh sort of a ton, uh, when they get aggressive, they can really move, and you have to have your wits about you because if one of these comes charging, he's not interested in you. But if you get in his way and he flattens you, you you've had it, you know. But you can see here there are, are females and well-grown pups, and again the same thing happens. They take a, a, a good period of time because here, look, you can see much smaller pups. So this is further down the coast. This is at Gold Harbour, and this is a this is a, a male. We were we were in a zodiac here, and he was just keeping his eye on us, making sure we weren't much of a threat. Um, but when they when they are getting aggressive, they really go for it. And you can see the gouges that on its neck where it's been fighting, made by these by these little fangs that are in the in the mouth here. These would you call them tusks, teeth? I suppose they are. And this is a female, uh, but really really special animals. And as I say, not totally bothered by us at all. The other seal that dominates here is the is the fur seal, and the, the the fur seals are this is an Antarctic fur seal. This is an adult male, and they were back setting up territories. And there were a lot of well-grown young, again, sort of waiting for for, for mum or dad to to come in and feed them, presumably mum to come in and feed them. And again, the, the sub-Antarctic brown skewers hanging around, and they're subtly different. They've got more white patches on them these these birds here down on south georgia and again they were just getting ready to breed and this was a pair that were but had set up a territory just inland a little way inland about half a mile inland they were they were on territory there and you can see there was still snow on the ground low down this is this is not much above sea level this is maybe maybe if we're 100 feet above sea level it's as much as we were this is this is a big breeding ground for gray-headed albatrosses and once you get to the once you get to the to South Georgian waters, you really start to pick up grey-headed albatross, and they are they are fantastic birds. They're just really really beautiful albatrosses, and you see big numbers of these. But there's 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 awful lot of seabird activity out on the sea where birds are going to feed, including penguins coming in in both coming in and going out. These are these are macaroni penguins porpoising. Um, again, as we came into Gold Harbour, um, they were coming into the colony. And these this is macaroni penguin. Uh, it gets its name from these straw-like strands of feathers on the top of its head, which is supposed to look like strings of macaroni. But they've got, they've got a, an interesting uh, uh, breeding, breeding strategy because they climb up the cliffs and the colony was about 300 feet above, above sea level where the cliffs began to become less sheer. Um, and, and how on earth these birds get up these cliffs? 
it is a wonder to me. And we actually saw one fall and it came down sort of quite a distance, quite a sort of length of that piece of cliff you're looking there. And it just picked itself up. It didn't seem to bother it a jot and it just picked itself up and carried on climbing again. And here too, where the, where the cliffs sort of pan out a little bit more and become slightly more level, you get these huge areas of, of this tussock grass, this, this, this local tussock grass. And in amongst these are the albatross colonies. So here you've got grey-headed albatross at the, the nest side and um, light mantle sooty albatross here. Um, we only managed to find a couple of a couple of nests of light mantle sooty, um, but nonetheless we found a couple, so that was that was pretty good. And again, the, the, all, all the time there are there are giant petrels hanging around. Most of these are young birds, but you'll notice these have got the red tips to the bill. So these are northern giant petrels. You look at these and you do have to wonder if they're actually a different species or if they're a subspecies, but this is the, the taxonomic arguments that go into, into these things because these breed in different areas to the southern giant petrels. But when they're around the colonies, they get a carcass. You can see here, this is a, a, an adult southern. You can see he's been feeding the carcass and there's a young bird. And the skewers are in the, the pecking order waiting to take their turn. So these are the, are the vultures of the southern oceans. Um, so there's a, a northern giant petrel there just for comparison. And they're, they're big birds. They've got a, a wingspan of over six feet. They are really big birds. So further back up the coast, this is this is the the, the, the old whaling whaling area of Gritvik, and this is the the, the centre of the really of what habitation was was and is on there. There's only a tiny little tiny little um, human um, settlement there, but it is only a settlement really of a few huts and a, and a museum. Um, and this is all the remnants of the old whaling industry that was here that, that decimated the whales, but also decimated these guys below and took the fur seals down to just a few hundred. A few hundred animals, if maybe even less than that. Um, and once the whaling stopped, the, the, the fur seals have just increased dramatically. And the signs around Gritvik, and these are old harpoon heads, um, whaling harpoon heads, the signs around Gritvik are, are, are there for you know everybody to see. And um, we're going to have a break in a few moments for, for Matt. I know he wanted to know in just a few moments. And there's old whale bones in, the, in Gritvik in here, um, quite evident. But the wildlife has moved back in, not totally, not concerned at all, and just takes it all in its stride. And there are things like Antarctic fur seals, and this is Antarctic tern, the southern counterpart of our Arctic terns. Just looks a little bit more like whiskered in some respects, but really, again, really, really tame and smashing little birds to see. And one or two real special birds, this is South Georgia pintail. It's actually a, a sub, an endemic subspecies of, of yellow-billed pintail. And, and they actually, in winter, they, they are slightly carnivorous. They will feed on, on carrion. Um, so they've changed, they've changed structurally and, and, and as I say, um, their diet and things like that because they've been isolated so long. And, and, and South Georgia's only passerine, this is, and I apologise for the photograph, excuse me, this is South, South Georgia pipit, um, found nowhere else in the world. Um, and things like the pipits and the and the the, 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 the pintail and that were really suffering because of the rats. And there's been one of these huge, huge programs to eradicate the rats. And since then, the prions, the pipits, everything has started to in increase drastically in numbers. And Gritviken is where Ernie Shackleton is buried. Ernie Shackleton died in 1922. Um, and and there's a, there's another fantastic Antarctic story that goes with with Ernie Shackleton, which I'll come on to in a, in a few minutes when we get to Elephant Island, because once we left South Georgia, we then headed down into the Antarctic proper or towards the Antarctic proper. Um, and all the way there, we had seabirds round the boat. I, 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 I joke not that from the time we left Puerto Madryn, in terms of numbers of birds, during daylight hours, there wasn't two minutes that we hadn't got birds around the boat of some description. Many of them followed us for a long way, but nonetheless, we had birds, often the same species, you know, in different places, but birds around the boat. So this is pintado or cape pigeon. These are some, some more shots. They, these, as, as we got further south, these became increasingly common. And they are just a fantastic little, little, little petrel. They're sort of maybe, maybe, Frequently bigger than a fulmar or fulmar sized, are fulmar sized, and they're just a really beautiful little bird. But in, in, incredible flyers, they really are. Um, and they were they were sort of with us on and off right throughout the rest of the trip pretty well. So pintados, I think you'll probably find there's a, a slight difference there in male and female. I think size very often with these petals. 
but um, but nonetheless they're sp splendid birds. And at this point, we, we well, from the Falklands, we'd seen these birds, but not really, really good views. We started to get big numbers of of white chinned petrel. Now, now white chinned petrel, are one of the big petrels, they're they're perhaps heading towards gull size, um, and at certain angles they can look quite skewer like. Um, but they're again relative with the fulmar and the, and the albatrosses, um, and they get their name from this little white chin that they've got there, or these great big fulmar like bills, but all, all pale by a few little dark lines, um, which splits them from things like Westland petrel that you would find around New Zealand. Um, well, they, 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 they have the big black nail on the end of the bill, and minor other differences, but there's a, a, a three or four of these really dark, large petrels that are in this, this group. So they were with us now, um, and increasing in numbers. And in terms of, in terms of reading something about those, and they were saying that um, when the when the, the long lining off, I'll go back to that one second. When the long lining off Brazil was really, really at its height, the, 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 the this species was the, the the bird that was caught as bycatch in the highest numbers for, for in, in in many many years, um, and and. This species has been declining for a number of years, and I think that the long lining is is largely to blame for for, for that. But uh, nonetheless, they're fantastic flyers. And as I say, they give, but at a distance, they can have quite a skewer-like shape. You can see there the the profile of the wings gives them a skewer-like look. And uh, and and every every hour or couple of hours, we see things like this is this is uh, uh, Southern Royal Albatross. Yeah, and we, we were having some of these birds coming in really, really close. And they're huge birds, huge wingspan, nine foot plus wingspan. And we had tremendous views of these, sometimes really, really close around the ship. Um, and uh, and then these, these birds spend the first four or five years at sea, uh, maybe six, seven years at times at sea before they actually come back to land to breed. And they're tremendous birds, really, really impressive flyers. And they, they, they come in using the, 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 the wind and air currents above the waves. To, to to sail in and out and they, they're just incredible and um there so so as we as we, we we get to towards elephant island this is the seat the scene that greets us now the story that why i mentioned shackleton and, and elephant island is that shackleton as many of you will probably know got shipwrecked um in the weddell sea um or around the weddell sea i think it was near the last night nice show and um what he'd done, they that sent an expedition, expedition down there, um, and they got, got there at the end of winter, hoping that the pack ice would thaw and that they would be able to get closer into the coastline. But in actual fact, what happened was the pack ice increased and entombed the ship, and they were stuck there until the ship was crushed by the ice, which took the best part of 18 months. And by this stage, they were running desperately short of food, people were ill. And what they did, because they'd, they'd, they had had sledge dogs, but unfortunately, they'd have to kill the dogs and eat them. They actually harnessed, put, put, they've got, I think they've got like dog harnesses, and they might converted them so that they fitted, they fitted the men, and they hauled three life, but three wooden lifeboats across the ice as far as they could to the edge of the pack ice. And then they got in these lifeboats, and they made it to Elephant Island. Now, the place that they came to, I mean, this is Elephant Island. It is just unbelievable. A place that they came to is this Point Wild, and this is where they landed. Um, and this is, bear in mind, this is spring here. And look at that. I, 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 I kid you not, I would not have been wanted to have been marooned there for three hours, and mind three months, as some of these guys were. But many of them were ill by the time they got there. And you can just about see there's a, there's a penguin colony there, and there's this rock, this rock pinnacle out of sea, and there's a beach just behind. Um, that's the penguin colony. And they were marooned on this beach, and there's some caves at the back of this, this lump here, and that was where they were stuck for three months. But Shackleton, and, and 12 other men managed to rig up a sail on one of the lifeboats and the rest of them were, were ill or weak and stayed with Frank Wilde, who was his second in command. So he looked after the shore party and Shackleton with just a compass and, and 12 men rowed or sailed, once he got the sail working, to South Georgia, which was, I think it was 800 to 900 miles away. I'm not sure of the exact mileage, but it's somewhere, somewhere about 870 miles, I think, is the, is the mileage. And, and amazingly, he found, he found South Georgia. 
by that point, only three of them were capable of making the crossing because they got onto the southern shore, and the whaling station at Gritmicken was on the northern shore, and it was, it, South George is 180 miles long, so they had to go over the top because it's quite narrow. I think it's like 20 miles wide. So, so him and two of the guys actually walked over the snow-covered mountains, and you can see what they were like from the, the photographs I showed you, and eventually got to Gritvicken, raised the alarm. They were taken on a, a whaler to, to Argentina. They got a, a tug. He got a tug from Argentina, and they went back to Elephant Island and rescued his men. But Elephant Island, the wildlife there, masses of masses of uh, 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 Gentoo penguins, huge colonies there, and that's what the, uh, Shackleton's men basically fed on them and seals and um, kept them alive. But but I'm told that penguin eating penguin, especially raw penguin, because they've got nothing to cook it, is pretty disgusting. And and I think it. It comes out as fast as it goes in almost. So I think it, they were all pretty ill by the time they got rescued. But the waters there are so clear. I mean, you can see here these on, on still in on the days when the, the weather is calm. These are gentoos under the water. You've seen them there. The previous shot, they're poor poison and then they go under the water. Just incredible, fantastic views there. But of course, all this all this uh, penguin activity attracts killer whales. Um, you can see there was a, a school of killer whales homed in. Uh, around the ship as we were there, and we had some tremendous views of killers. There were about 20 in this book, one particular um, school that we saw, and um, we had some tremendous views of them as they were coming all around. And I think they were, I think they came to have a look at us, really, to be nosy. I think they were, I think they were probably just relieving the monotony of daily life. I think they were, because they were circling the boat, just having a look at us. I don't know, they were saying if they, they fancied any of us to eat, but I think they decided we were a bit, a bit old and grisly, so they left us to it. Um, but we had some tremendous views of. Of, of, uh, of killer whales. Um, black browed albatross here going past them. And um, what was interesting, I, I think the, the, the closest black browed albatrosses were way north of here. Because I don't think there's any there's any black browed albatrosses in that area as far as I'm aware. Um, somebody might correct me, but um, so these birds travel real distances to feed and they mainly have to krill, which they find. And I'm told that the, the way that they find this, as scientists understand it now, is that when krill comes to the surface, near the surface, it gives off a gas and the, the, the gas is carried on the, on the wind and the, the albatrosses can, can pick, the, pick the scent of this gas up and they follow it on the wind and they can home in on the krill, krill swarms like that. And that's how they find their, find their food. But there were, so there, were, there were killer whales, there were humpback whales, we saw fin whale, we saw Antarctic minke whale, um, all sorts of stuff. From here, we went down into, from there, we went down into the Weddell Sea and this is the, the, the start of the Weddell Sea. This is a passage going into the Weddell Sea. And this is where we were hoping to find emperor penguins. And, and the Weddell Sea is a, a dramatic looking place, as you can see. Um, icebergs everywhere, what's called brash ice, which is this. You can see it's like almost like a slick. It's actually like a, a film across the across the water here. It's it's where the, the, the pack ice is breaking up for the summer. And here's where we picked up snow petrels. So we were seeing, we were seeing snow petrels and th these are what are now known as lesser snow petrels and again there's another one of these great big debates taxonomy debates because the on Balani Island round towards the New Zealand end of the, the Antarctic there's sort of an island called Balani and there are what are called greater snow petrels there which basically di differ in just the, the shape and size so they're all white like these they look like a large version of these and there's a big taxonomic argument is are they a subspecies? Are they a species? Are they indeed any subspecies at all? Because apparently on Balani, 28%, around 28% of all the breeding pairs are mixed, greater and lesser snow petals. So you have to wonder, are these actually a species or is it just you've got large and small individuals? But nonetheless, snow petals are a pretty stunning bird. And, and as I was, I've got one, one more slide of these in a little while, but what's really interesting when you get them from above, the, the head, they've, they've sort of developed a little bit almost like a miniature beluga whale, and both the eyes point downwards so they can scan the sea as they, come, as they fly over it, and you'll see that on the last shot later on in the, in the tour. The weather closed in there, and as I said to you earlier, we, we had thick fog closed in, it just became, it was still, this fog bank rolled in and just in, encapsulated the whole the whole sea, and they, they tried to sit it out for a while, but then the weather reports were coming in to say it was just it was just not going not happening for several days. The, the the weather system had locked in, so they eventually about turned and headed towards Deception Island. And as we get out into the straits back towards Deception Island, we hit a storm, 
Um, at one point, one between halfway between um, South Georgia and Antarctica, we hit a force ten gale. Um, and that was that was interesting. You could see you could see the the the, the bar restaurant, whatever lounge, whatever you like to call it, on the, on the ship that had been full before we hit the storm. Within twenty minutes, there were about six of us left in the, left in the bar, and uh, and the, the the ship was was eight decks above the water, and the waves were breaking over the top of the ship. And um, so, needless to say, nobody was allowed out to during that. But as we went into Deception Island, we were surrounded by Southern Four Mars. We got the first real taste of Southern Four Mars in numbers, um, and Pintados again, numbers of Pintados, and they followed us right into the mouth of Deception Island because Deception Island is a is a, is, is a collapsed volcano. It's, it's like the, the caldera of a collapsed volcano. And this gap here is what's called Neptune's Bellows. And you go, th come in through there and into, into Deception Island itself. And you can see the storm front there as we, as we came in. And the, and the, the sort of wind abated a little bit there, but it was still pretty evil in there. Um, and it was blinking cold. It really was cold. Um, I think it went down to minus 15 at night, um, minus 11 and a half during the day. So it was, it was nice and warm, as you can see. But the, 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 the southern four miles um, were, were, were stunning. We had some great views of southern four miles there. Um, and this is where we, we sort of got to groups with Weddell Seal at the old whaling station. So this is the old, the old whaling station in, in Deception Island. Um, but, the, but the ships don't tend to hang around in there too long because, and you warned, because the original plan was... To, was to, to, to disembark and go and have a look at the Gentoo penguin colony, but it, the weather was too bad. But you don't hang around there because it's still potentially an active volcano. So they, uh, they, they, they basically take you in for the least time possible. And um, we, we caught up with these guys. So this is Weddell Seal, and we got some nice views of close up of Weddell Seal, um, just rising in the, in, on the ice there. Um, and they're, they're quite a distinctive shape. They've got these small heads. Quite, I think got quite a little dog-like head, but then quite long and plenty of blubber on them to keep them warm. And these fantastically uh, insulated fur coats that you can see there. And he wasn't slightly bit worried about the snow and the ice. He was uh, quite happy sunbathing there. Um, so we left Deception Island after after a while and headed down into onto the Antarctic Peninsula proper. And and as you go into the Antarctic Peninsula proper, the, the scenery is just something else. It's just absolutely stunning. Um, we explored by Zodiac, so we go down into an area and stop and go ashore on Zodiacs, and, and everything was all monitored. And at one point, we were we were ashore at one of the at an Argentinian whale, an Argentinian research station, and all of a sudden, with the, the wind changed direction, and we could see all this floating brash ice coming in towards us. And the, 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 the crew was everybody off, everybody off. We all had to get into the boats and and get back to the ship before we were stuck there. But they always take. Plenty of supplies, and, and as I say, the, the scenery is just absolutely something else. It's just tremendous. So lots of icebergs, as you'd expect. Great high mountains covered in covered in snow and ice, as you can see here. Um, and when you go ashore, all the time you're heading for places that have got penguin colonies. Usually, um, this is at a place called Brown Bluff, and these are, are daily penguins. And um, there were hundreds and hundreds of these there at that place. But they're fantastic little birds. I'm not bothered by this at all. I'm just going about their daily business, coming backwards and forwards in great lines, as you could see there. Um, and obviously, many of them had been out to sea and were coming in to feed partners that were incubating. You see, many of the, the dailies here were incubating. This was a pair that had just got together, and that, that was their greeting. They throw their heads back. And what was interesting, you don't see it. Right? They throw up this like, little crest on the back of the nape, and they sing to each other, if you call it singing, more like sort of squawking to each other. Um, and very often with these, we now shoot with a chin strap penguin later. Once one pair started, loads of pairs in the colony all started. So they're all doing this singing all together in, in unison. Um, but these are daily penguins, as I say, and they're one of, one of the smaller penguins, but they're really special birds. Here's one uh, that's incubating at the moment. And uh, you obviously put the, puts the eggs sort of on top of its feet and, and curls it into the, the blubber and the feathers and, and manages to keep it warm that way. Um, but stunning little birds. I, th I think, actually, I, I have to say, I think these are probably my favourites out of the penguins. They're, there's just something about them. I think they're all real little characters. Further down the coast, we came to a big area that's uh, a Gentoo penguin colony. And you can see here, this is on the edge of a, a glacier here. And while we were there, a huge piece fell, actually fell off this glacier. 
needless into the sea, needless to say, you don't get close to these glaciers on the zodiacs. And you can see here the cracks as the crevices as they start to break up. But you can see here where the where the penguins go up and down, you can see them tobogganing, what they call tobogganing when they lie on their bellies and stuff. And you can see slides that the, they use to get to get down there faster. So they 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 go up and down on their bellies and awful lot. You can see one doing it here. Um, and this is how they cover cover quite large distances quicker is by the tobogganing, this tobogganing method. Um, but I, I, Gen, 2s are, Gen 2s are in big numbers here. Um, and and they're, they're really interesting to watch. And you can see many traits, sort of almost human traits in them, you know, the way they sort of stand around and look at each other. And here they're having a, a, a cuddling up to each other and, you know, pair, pair bonding, this would be. Um, and, and here they were getting a bit amorous. Uh, and then... They are having a punch up. Some of them are having a punch up, and they really got got got, got quite stroppy with each other. These two, I don't know what they were fighting over because there was no nest nearby. They just took a dislike to each other. They started having a having a ding dong, and they they were at it for a few minutes. Um, and in the end, they just sort of stopped, and one went one way, one went the other way. So I don't know what it was all about. But they they obviously knew, but um, but so such is life. And you know, I think I thought quite a lot of human traits in in these birds. But but somebody said to me, penguins can't fly. I said, oh, I don't believe that for a second because this picture shows it shows that they clearly can. Um, this was one jumping off off a, an ice ledge onto the, onto a boulder strewn beach. Then the, the padding that they've got. I mean, they've got these tremendously thick pads on the base of the feet, but the blubber around them protects them from so much. And they, they landed on these rocks and stood up. And once it once it sorted itself out and got into the sea, and away it went. Just unbelievable. But down to Oran Island, we, we went ashore into a chin strap colony. Um, and they're, they're pretty special chin straps all as well. They're, they're, all, they're all nice in their own way. And picking out a favourite is very, very hard. And you can see how they get their name. This is a, this is a chin strap. A um, bit, bigger, bit bigger than a, than, than an Adelie. Um, probably similar size to a, a Gen 2, but stockier, I would say. Um, and they're pretty special. And here's a, a pair doing the, the greeting. I've got a, another slide with about four or five of them all doing this together. Because one had started and then, then they'd all start. And it was really quite, quite interesting to watch them as they do this. Obviously greeting each other as they come back. But they seem to be slightly lighter than the, than the Gen 2s and the Adelies because none of them seem to have eggs at this point. Um, but we saw probably uh, of the Antarctic penguins we saw in numbers, these were the, the least numbers, although I think that was just the area that we were at. And when around these colonies, just like uh, on the other islands and that, there are the scavengers. So here, of course, you've got the sheath bills. Um, this is pale, pale faced sheath bill. Um, there's a there's a second species of sheath bill on other, on other plate on other islands and that in different parts of the Antarctic. I think it's black faced sheath bill. I think is the other, the other species, but we didn't come across that. But, but that's a sheath bill close to, and you can see this really sort of hard skin around the around the eye that's really thick adaptation against the cold and these ridges and that really thick downy feathers that cover the cover the birds or the bird's skin to protect it against the cold and they're really interesting bird because because they were they're, they're real mischiefs they are and we had some on the ship they came onto the ship and they're, they're trying to pull all, all the, the ropes off the life belts and things like that uh, to pieces so that they can take them off for nesting material they're, they're devils they are they were <laughs> really mischievous Skewers, of course, here are, are represented largely by South Polar skewers. And on the peninsula, they're mainly the dark birds. So these are South Polars. And South Polars are really quite black bodies, black wings, but it's sort of, most of them have this sort of shawl of sort of gold buff um, neck, neck flex and this bit of white around the base of the bill. So you can see there, same as I was saying before about the size, the female below, male above, and you can see he's a smaller bird. But he's got, uh, they were amazing, but he got quite aggressive at one point, or so it seemed, and he was really stating his, stating his claim. And uh, and then afterwards, again, they were quite amorous. They were, they were cuddling up, necking, necking with each other, these, these two birds. So it's interesting to watch. And this is one of the same birds flying around. And a feature I've not seen on, on other skewers, other than, of course, the, the ones in the Northern Hemisphere, things like ponds and arctics, is that on the towers, a lot of the birds seem to have this pip that we were seeing here. This is an intermediate phase bird. You can see the body is slightly paler. We saw a few pale birds, but mostly, mostly at a distance. And if you remember the very start photograph, I showed you that. It's got a pale um, South Polar skewer on it. But nonetheless, they were, they were quite uh, prevalent and, and quite aggressive birds. But the, the, one of the top predators here is the leopard seal. Of course, they feed on 
penguins and other seals, mainly penguins. Um, and uh, this one was on an ice floe, and he was just basking there. And he was quite quiet until all of a sudden he realised, well, he knew we were there. But he just opened his eyes and gave us this look and just, yeah, don't mess with me sort of look. And this this, this seal was about 12 feet long, so it was a, a whopper. Um, I don't know whether it was a... I think it was a female, to be honest, but I'm, I wouldn't swear to that. But, um, but it was a, a monster nonetheless and gave us this this real sort of uh, evil look as if to say, do not mess with me. And that's it there. It looks quite angelic, doesn't it? It looks, looks really peaceful. But uh, there was a, a British marine biologist killed by one of these a few years back, about six years ago. Um, she was actually in the sea and it grabbed her uh, oxygen tank and took her down really deep. And, and, and they think that, that it realised it had got something that wasn't its normal prey and, and possibly even realised it had got a human because it brought her back to the surface and let her go. And it hadn't actually badly injured her but what she'd done it had drowned her in the process I think as it had taken down a mask and tank and that whether the, the airlines had been ruptured or not but I believe she died through through this seal taking her down but I suppose that, that's the risk you take if we go into areas like this then you've got dangerous wildlife so these are as we were saying about the imperial shags or blue-eyed shags they get into quite big rafts at times just like cormorants in other parts of the world do and all feed together they're a really stunningly beautiful bird. And again, minor subspecies difference. These ones tend to show quite a bit of white in the wing here. And quite a lot of them have a white bar on the back, on the sort of base of the rump. And that's a close-up of, a, a, of a, an imperial shag's head. Um, really quite a stunning looking bird. And we saw them breeding on South Georgia, but not really, really close to. They were up on the cliff face in amongst the, the tougher grass like the, like the albatrosses were. Um, so... Um, that's the imperial shag. And again, as I say, we, we, we were sort of getting to the point where we'd explored lots of places, we'd coming across all sorts of birds, some of which we'd seen before. Um, and we'd, we'd got most of the species we wanted there by this point. And this is another, another shot of a snow petrel. And you can see what I mean about the head being shaped so that both the eyes can look down at the sea as the birds flying around. And that makes sense, really, because they feed from the surface of the sea. So it, it makes sense to be able to watch the sea all the time to, to find, you know, krill and, and, and small small fish and that sort of stuff that the birds are going to feed on. Because obviously finding food out there is, is the main priority of, of, of any creature. And that sort of adaptation helps. Antarctic Antarctic petrel, we, we, we came across these eventually. We had some smashing views of these. Um, another one of these, these sort of medium-sized, full-more-sized petrels. And they're a pretty smart-looking bird, really, with this deep chocolate brown and, and white. And towards the tail end of the, the time down in the Antarctic, we had some good numbers of these around the ship. And we had some super weather as well while we were down there. So we, we couldn't have asked for better weather once we were down on the peninsula itself. Once we got down to the to the to sort of southern end of where we were going, right towards the, the actual Antarctic Circle itself, that, that on the Bransfield Strait, the scenery is just is just out of this world. It's just stunning. It's just fantastic. Really incredible. And you can see there these really high mountains with and you can see the depth of the snow over there. I mean, these are sort of icebergs down at the bottom here. So that gives you some idea of the sheer height of these cliffs. I mean, you're probably looking at hills 2,000 plus feet high there, but uh, incredible cliffs. And these huge overhangs on the tops of them, the snow over thousands of years that's built up. So at that point, we we had to we had to move from there back towards South America. Um, our, our Antarctic journey, that leg of it was largely done. So the next bit was was two days at sea, crossing the the the, the Drake Passage, and this was seabird watching time. It was a time of petrels and and sheer waters and the like. Um, and, and as we left um, on the Antarctica for the most of the first day, we'd got numbers of Antarctic petrels, which is this bird here, an absolutely stunning looking bird, as you can see. Lots of, of southern four miles around the boat as we were, we were heading north. Um, Pintado petrels. And at times we had snow flurries. And it was really interesting seeing these birds flying in the snow. You know, I think of them fly, keeping flying during the snow, but they did, they didn't bother them at all. Um, we had some really interesting sightings there. The, the pintados or cape pigeons are, 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 as I said before, a real special looking bird. They're superb, they really are. And these birds are, are really well adapted. The, the, the pintados and the, and the Antarctic petrels and the snow petrels and the, and the fulmars, they all breed on, 
on ledges in you know, on the on the cliff faces in in these places, and some of them breeding little like crevices and holes in the it, that they that they they get in the into the the, the the ice on the top of the cliffs, um, and and the, the the thing is like with snow petrel, for instance. I think the, the the figures that I've seen, they don't really know what the population is, but but the 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 the, 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 the counts at the colonies they know of, something come come close to half a million birds, something like that. But they they think that the world population is something like four and a half million birds. So the, so that there are a lot of these colonies that aren't even known about where they where they breed these birds. And then and a lot of these birds, these species that I've been mentioning just stay on the limit of the pack ice right throughout the polar winter. So they're really, really hardy creatures and they've got amazing adaptations to to a, a really, really harsh environment. As we look about about um, Three quarters of a day into our voyage across there, we started to see blue petrels. And by by the evening, we had a flock of blue petrels found the ship. And we came to the conclusion that these birds were on their way to breeding grounds because for the next 24 hours, they, they were they were around the ship when we turned in at last light. And they were around the ship still at dawn the following morning until lunchtime when we steamed out of this flock of, of blue petrels. And they'd been around, there must have been hundreds of thousands of birds in this flock. It was just incredible. It was just fantastic to see birds still in these numbers in, in, in the oceans there. It really was. And these are blue petrels, fantastic little petrels. They really are. And they're bigger than a storm petrel, but not as big as a fulmar. So they're, they're between the two, more the size of a prion. And they have this, this, white tip to the tail which is totally diagnostic look much like a prion in in many respects but have this dark crown to the top of the head um and and you, you look at them and you think well i can't tell a male from a female but when you get a pair together it becomes more obvious and then the males are darker and bluer um but they're really nice little birds they're really really nice. so we were we were having them and in with them you have to really watch because there are prions all the time um and and here, here's an, an interesting shot because You've actually got on that photograph three species. If I go on like that and blow it up, you lose the quality a little bit. But look at the bills and the head shapes. So here you've got slender bill prion. There you've got Antarctic prion. Look, black around the face, heavier bill. Okay, and an altogether heavier bird. And here is one of the special ones we found. This is McGillivray's pe uh, prion. And it's really big, heavy head. Look, rounded head, really dark mask, big chunky bill. So that's McGillivray's prion. Um, that was the only one of the trip we saw. We didn't even realise we'd seen it until we got the photographs back into the cabin and, and started to analyse the photographs, and then we realised what we were looking at there. Um, and subsequently from that, I've actually found this, and this is Salvin's prion, which is from Gough Island. Um, and I think there's some go up towards, I think it's Gough Island, just in Detuna maybe, where, the, where there are a few. Um, but this is one of the species that on Gough that's been really struggling with the problem, the infestation of rats and mice on on there, so this is one of the species that the RSPB are doing the, or have been doing the work on Gough Island to try and eradicate the the, the rodents off there to protect these these birds. Um, and so that's that's a Salvin's prion. Um, quite again, quite a smart looking bird. Um, there's a close up of, of, of the same bird, much like an Antarctic petrel, but subtle differences in bill shape and face patterning and things like that. Light mantle sooty albatrosses, we had some tremendous views here. That this, this last day of the, at sea, we've we got some absolutely stunning views of, of some of the albatrosses. And at one point, that's, a, that's a, an adult bird, the first one. This is a, a second, second calendar cycle bird. Um, so this is an immature bird. And this is a, a slightly older, but going into a, a bird in wing molt here. You can see this bird in the snow here. That's another shot of it. You can see the, the adult feathers coming in and the, the juvenile feathers that it's losing there. So this is another one in, in one of the stages of molt. So they go through various cycles because the, the, the molt processes with albatrosses is not on a, a fully annual basis. It spans many, many months. So consequently, they call it cycles rather than, rather than you know, summer molt or spring molt or whatever. Grey-headed albatrosses were around the ship. This is a youngster um, in, in different age groups. Again, we had tremendous views of grey-headed albatrosses here. Um, and this is uh, these are these are wandering albatrosses. We started to see these. We'd seen some wanderers right through the trip rod ones, but we got we got a number here. Um, and this is Gibson's this is Gibson's um, wandering albatross. Um, this is Antipodean wandering albatross with a, a light mantle sooty here. Got the cap on the head. This is an adult. And this is snowy wandering albatross. 
Um, this is a male, and, and I think you can tell males usually by this yellow patch on the, on the neck. And what happens is that the, as the, the birds drink salt water, obviously it's the only way they can get water, when they excrete the, the salt water, it comes out with an oil out of the nostrils. And the, the theory is that it blows back and discolors this part of the neck. And on the females, it doesn't happen because the skull shape is slightly different. So it actually misses the nape when they think that's how you, that's what causes it, is what the, the theory is. And that's, uh, that's how you split the males from the female. So this is a snowy wandering albatross. Um, and one of the last ones we picked up on, this is a, a northern royal albatross. And you, you look at the subtle differences in the wing. It's got an all dark leading edge to the wing. Other minor differences in the pattern in here. Um, so that's northern northern royal. The bills are different to wanderers. There are subtle differences in the bill as well. One show a stronger gape line on, on the wandering albatross. And this is off. This is off the southern most tip of, of Argentina. This is, uh, I think this is Isla Navarino, this island. Um, and, and at this point, we, we headed into the Beagle Channel um, and, and, and docked to Ushuaia. So this is just a little way from, from the, the port of just outside the town of Ushuaia, looking across the, the Beagle Channel to the Isla Navarino. And you've got loads and loads of kelp gulls there. Kelp gulls were a feature right throughout the throughout the, the trip. I'm going to talk to you about those in just a second. But you can see numbers of kelp gulls there. Because on the islands, again, you've got different subspecies. So these are these are a pair, male on the left, female on the right, of, of kelp gulls from from uh, Ushuaia. Um, these are the birds that you see locally there. And you look, the legs are sort of a, a yellowy green there. Okay, um, look at the bill structure in that there. So this is this is another another one from Ushuaia, but he's got greener legs. So subspecies oh, questionable. I don't know on that one. These are ones from from South Georgia. So you can see on South Georgia they've got distinctly yellow legs. Um, really, really noticeably yellow legs. And this is one from the Antarctic Peninsula. Look how thick the bill is there. All still all, all kelp gulls, but um, but again, all different subspecies. And of course, kelp gull is what's just been recorded at Grafham Water. That some of you may have even gone to see this. This they were calling Cape gull, which is the, the South African subspecies of 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 this this bird. Um, so one and the same. And this is what was initially called Southern Blackback. So it's now known as kelp gull. Um, the skewers, we've got to, you can see kelp gull here again, but with them, um, when they're resting on the, on the shore of Tequoia, you get Chilean skewers. So this is Chilean skewer, another one of these cataracta, cataract, I can never say that word, cataracta skewers, I think you call them. Um, here's one in action. Well, look how gingerly rufous that is there. Um, and he was coming in robbing food off the, off the kelp gulls and sometimes being chased off by them. And you can see here, this is, you can see these gingerly spots all in the, in the rump, and he's not too ginger above, but shows a really distinct black black cap. And from the underside, you can see this really warm cinnamon ginger sort of coloration that the bird has. Now, I mentioned I've talked to you about upland geese again, and this is the mainland subspecies of upland geese. And you'll see the males, these are the males, have got a lot more barring on them than the birds on the Falklands. Slightly, slightly difference in size, but uh, nonetheless, they're, they're the same species, but a different subspecies, which seems to be part of the course here. Every island and an area seems to have its own subspecies of many of these birds. So here's Chilean skewers in action. Um, just the same way as our great skewers with Harry gulls here, that they do exactly the same. And on the mainland, these are the dolphin gulls. So you've got a young bird and adults here. Um, they're in a, in a genus all of their own, and they've got a really distinctive bill shape. They've got this sort of like flange at the side of the bill here. And for a long time, they were considered as just one subspecies. But as I understand it now, the, the taxonomists have, have decided that the birds on the Falkland Islands are a separate subspecies. And indeed, the birds I saw there didn't have such a pronounced flange here. And some of them, seem, the adults, seem to have slightly darker heads. But I thought, what a special looking bird they are. These adult dolphin gulls are really, really superb looking things. Um, but the best of all the gulls put together, I think. But, um, nonetheless, so there's, there's other species there as well as the seabirds. There's things like flightless steamer ducks. So this is one that you don't see on the Falklands. This is a male, on the, a male on the right, female on the left, a flightless steamer duck. and got really, really tiny reduced wings. And in the same area, you've got flying steamer ducks, so just to confuse you. But there were numbers uh, of wintering um, beds and white rump sandpipers. And by numbers, I'm talking perhaps a couple of hundred in a, in a flock, mixed flock there. So this is beds um, and feeding along the shoreline there. And here's white rumped. And it was great to see them so well and really get to grips with these birds. And 
compare the two species side by side. Um, and now we're on the shore. And you've got things like we had the odd black, blackish oyster catcher, and we had southern lapwings on the on the on the, the land and things like that. Um, and mixed in with them, one or two other really interesting species as we got stopped slightly further inland. Land. This is black-faced ibis feeding just in the edge of the woodlands. And what was interesting, you can see that that the the effect of invasive species. Here you've got dandelions, and they're everywhere. And that's something that uh, I won't say. Us Brits took there, but certainly Westerners took dandelions to South America, and they are everywhere around Ushuaia that way. Um, one of the small passerines of the forest there is a is a this this guy. This is a thorn-tailed rayadito, and interestingly, you might have seen it uh, last week. It was announced that scientists on one of the islands off the southern coast of Argentina have literally just found and and released news of a, of a brand new species of rayadito on one particular island that's just been discovered. Uh, but they're, they're one of the furnits, so they're, for those of you that are birded in South America, they're close relatives of spine tails and wood creepers, that group. They're, they're, there goes another story in its own. Um, and predators, of course, are represented by things like black-breasted buzzard eagle. Uh, there are Andean condors and various caracaras, but we missed Andean condor by a few moments. We were, we were in one vehicle, the vehicle behind us saw, when we got to which well, saw two Andean condors and we missed them. So we were not happy bunnies on that one, but still, never mind, something to go back for. And one of the reasons that I wanted to go was, as many of you know, I'm a, I'm a wildlife artist and I wanted to draw and record as much as I could. Um, and so all the time I was sketching, I got, I did, if I wasn't photographing, I was sketching. And if I wasn't sketching, I was eating. And then I was photographing and sketching and eating with a bit of sleep in between. By the end of it, I felt, felt I needed a holiday to go on my holiday. But to, anyway, suffice to say that these are these are young wandering albatrosses on Prion Island of South Georgia. This is uh, white-chinned petrel over to the left here and Atlantic petrel at sea. Uh, I, did, I did a few little bits of watercolour while I was there. This is Cobb's wren on the, on, on the Falklands. Um, feeding amongst the tideline debris and South Georgia pipit. I, I didn't get particularly good views of South Georgia pipit for photography, but I managed to get some sketches. And they're, they're a bit more like a lark in terms of shape. They're quite a dumpy thing, and they, they fly up and give a display flight just like a just like a, a pipit in you know a rock pipit or a meadow pipit would in, in in the northern hemisphere. But they're really chunky, thick things, and they've got a, a bit more of a bit more of a lark look to them when they're feeding on the ground. And so those are the sketches that I've been doing. And if you want to see any more of those, you'll have to wait till my book comes out. And there you go. That's the end of our journey to Antarctica. Thank you very much.